Gospel according to Luke, beginning at the 19th chapter. After he had said this, Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethage, Bethage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who went, who were, went sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Now you can have a seat because there's a little bit more to this story. And we pick up in the 22nd chapter of Luke. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of heaven of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one who, whom he has betrayed. Then he began to ask one another, they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to who, as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them and those in authority over them are also called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on to you, just as my Father has conferred on to me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you 
that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to them, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. And he also said to them, when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, no, not a thing. He said to them, but now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag, and the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless. And indeed, what is written about me is being fulfilled. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He replied, it is enough. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a problem with Palm Sunday. In years past, uh, the congregation or the children, after the reading of the first part of today's gospel lesson, would parade around the church, waving their palms, shouting, Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Quite a spectacle. And today is Palm Sunday, the day on which Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a young donkey. This day has been described by Christians for generations as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But have you ever asked yourself if this was a triumphal entry, then why did they crucify Jesus at the end of the week? Unknowingly, the crowd is enthusiastically participating, I think, in a funeral procession, kind of like New Orleans style. Even the Revised Common Lectionary, which we use, also sees this Sunday as a problem. And it's a problem for us because they give us two readings from the Gospels. One reading is from this passage, and it's called the, the Palms reading, the first one that I read. Because of the palm branches that those who would greet Jesus line his way uh, in, into the city. In our reading today, people instead spread their cloaks before Jesus' path. And we don't call today Cloak Sunday. The other reading is from the Passion reading. Because the suffering of Christ at the end of the week is called the Passion of Christ. I chose to end that reading prior to those passages which deal with Good Friday through the resurrection. We will deal with those more fully later this week. So we have a problem today that we need to address. If this is such a glorious Sunday for all Christians, what goes wrong by Friday that Jesus will find himself betrayed by one of his own disciples, arrested by the high priest's guard, accused by a coalition of religious leaders, tried by the Roman governor, and sentenced to die the death of a common criminal, death by crucifixion. Is it possible that Jesus' procession into Jerusalem was not the only procession that city saw that day? Traditionally, Pilate paraded into Jerusalem on the first day of the Passover week. He entered the west gate, the front gate, with legions of chariots, horses, foot soldiers, dressed for battle and armed with swords and spears. Rome's authority 
would not be questioned. The majesty in which Pilate enters the front door of the city was meant to inspire awe and fear, respect and obedience. Imagine the spectacle of that entry. From the western side of the city, the opposite side from which Jesus would enter, our, uh, Pilate leads Roman soldiers on horseback and on foot. Each soldier clad with leather armor polished to a high gloss, each centurion head hammered helmets gleaming in the bright sunlight at their sides sheathed in their scabbards were swords crafted from the heart of steel and in their hands each centurion carried a spear or if he was an archer a bow with a sling of arrows across his back drummers beat out a cadence in the march for this was no ordinary entry into Jerusalem Pilate was governor of the region which included not only Judea but Samaria and Eden. And it was a standard practice for the Roman governor of a foreign territory to be in its capital for religious celebrations. It was the beginning of Passover, a strange Jewish festival that the Romans allowed. However, the Romans must have been aware that this festival celebrated the deliberation of Jews from another empire, the empire of Egypt. So Pilate had to be in Jerusalem. Since the Romans had occupied this land by defeating the Jews and deposing their king about 80 years earlier, uprisings were always in the air. The last major uprising, long before Pilate's time, had been after the death of Herod the Great in 4 BC. That uprising started about five miles from Jesus' boyhood home of Nazareth. Before it was over, that city and the capital of Galilee and the town of Emmaus had been destroyed by the Roman army. After putting down the rebellion there, the Romans marched on Jerusalem. And after pacifying that city, they crucified over 2,000 Jews who were accused of being part of the rebellion. The Romans had made their intolerance for rebellion well known. And so on this occasion, the Passover, Pilate had traveled with a contingent of Rome's finest from his preferred headquarters in Caesarea by the sea to the stuffy, crowded provincial capital of the Jews, Jerusalem. Entering from the opposite side of the city is Jesus, fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. These are the words prophesied by Zechariah, the prophet who, uh, Zechariah, the prophet who prophesied, uh, proclaims the coming of the Messiah. This scripture would not be lost on the Jewish religious leaders. Now, what is going on in the minds of those honoring Jesus? Those along the road, if we go with spreading palms, well, which only a king would be greeted this way. In, in uh, Second Kings, it's, it's stated, when hurriedly they all took their cloaks and spread them for him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. And the people wanted Jesus to be their king. But the people did not understand what kind of king Jesus would be. They expected their Messiah to be a great political and military leader who would free them from the tyranny of the Roman Empire. 
But the kingdom of God is not of this world. It is a spiritual kingdom for the people who put their faith and trust in God. So like many other times in Jesus' ministry, the tables are turned and what is first expected by the disciples and the crowd is changed into something entirely different. The priests and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, are alarmed. They do as the Roman, they do, and, and the Roman authorities also seek to keep the peace in the normal operation of the temple. You know, the high priest was even appointed by the Roman prefect. So entangled were the religious leaders and the Roman rulers. For the disciples, the euphoria of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem must have been a dream come true. Jesus, however, keeps turning the tables on those who want an uprising against the Romans. He also warns the apostles of his impending death, even during the meal that we celebrate as the last or the Lord's Supper. Today, today's Holy Communion, where we will today share in the meal of Christ's body and blood. And Jesus speaks of the betrayal of one around the table, and the apostles speculate who that might be. In true human fashion, they then argue among themselves who is the greatest. Jesus turns the tables again on the apostles by declaring them all to be servant leaders and in so doing inheritors of a kingdom, the heavenly kingdom. You know, Jesus sees us as we are, human. The apostles argue over who's the greatest in their humanness. Simon Peter, in his humanness, will deny Christ three times. Judas will betray Jesus in his humanness. The priests in the Sanhedrin will protect the status quo in their humanness. The crowd will select Bar uh, Barabbas, who in Luke was part of an insurrection against the Romans over, over Jesus, who is not a warrior in their humanness. Humanness plays a part for us today. But fortunately, there is grace and the forgiveness of our humanness. We can do nothing to deserve this. Only by the grace of God, the sacrificial act of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit can over and overcome our humanness. The problem with Palm Sunday is what we celebrate. We don't celebrate an earthly king we celebrate Jesus, who is both fully human and fully divine. In his humanness, Jesus leads us to the cross. As we take up our own cross, we become inheritors of the kingdom of God.